Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Cha. I'm a senior advisor and career chair here at CSIS and professor of government at Georgetown University. And we're very happy uh, to discuss today um, U.S.-Korea relations, uh, the upcoming summit of uh, Madame Park geun as well as uh, civil nuclear cooperation and the so-called one, two, three negotiations. Um, with us to discuss these issues today are people who I think are familiar to many of you. Um, <coughs> so I'll go in the order of which they will be speaking. Gary Seymour is the executive director for Harvard Kennedy oh, School's you. Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Uh, he served at the National Security Council from 1995 to 2001, and of course, more recently, just left uh, the National Security Advisor um, as the uh, senior, what were you called? Coordinator. Senior coordinator. Um, weapons uh, and mass destruction. For weapons and mass destruction and nonproliferation. Um, <clears throat> uh, speaking next will be Sharon Squassoni, who is a director and senior fellow of the Proliferation Prevention Program here at CSIS. Um, she has advised Congress on these sorts of issues as well as worked at Newsweek uh, and in the executive branch of the government and as well as Director of Policy Coordination and the Nonproliferation Bureau at the Department of State. Uh, and then um, uh, speaking last but not least, uh, of course, is Ambassador Christopher Hill, who is Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies at Denver University. Uh, is a former career diplomat, four-time ambassador, uh, as well as um, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and the head of the U.S. delegation for the, for the six-party talks. So the way we will proceed in the limited time that we have is I've asked each of our um, uh, panelists to start out with some opening remarks, uh, and then uh, we'll have a little bit of back and forth in the group, and then we'll go to you in the audience um, for questions. I think this is being simulcast live. I don't know if we have a Twitter feed up, but if we do, um, I guess somebody will let me know. Um, but to, to get us started, please, uh, Gary, if you could sort of give us your views on where you think things are right now. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Uh, just to remind everybody, I'm a private citizen now, so I'm giving my own views, not the views of the administration. So for over two years now, the U.S. and Korea have been negotiating to uh, replace the existing Peaceful Nuclear Cooperation Agreement, the so-called 1-2-3 Agreement. And frankly, the two sides remain very far apart on the essential issue of prior consent, whether the U.S. would permit South Korea to process or enrich U.S. origin nuclear material for peaceful purposes. Now, the immediate technical issue that the two sides have been debating is whether pyroprocessing, which is a form of reprocessing, uh, is a suitable method for South Korea to treat and manage its nuclear waste from its very large nuclear power industry. Uh, the U.S. position is that a final decision should await the results of a 10-year joint study that the U.S. and South Korea are conducting and which includes actually building an, a small-scale operating pyroprocessing facility in the United States to test whether the technology is technically and economically viable. The South Korean position is that uh, even though they have no immediate plans to build an industrial-scale pyroprocessing facility, they want a commitment or indication from the United States that when the time comes, the U.S. will grant prior consent and allow South Korea um, to treat uh, U.S. origin uh, spent nuclear fuel through this pyroprocessing process. The South Korean government also argues that as a new um, nuclear exporter, it needs to be able to offer a full suite of nuclear fuel cycle services, including enrichment and reprocessing, in order to compete with other nuclear vendors in the world, all of whom, by the way, have full nuclear fuel cycle services, except for the United States, which doesn't have any processing. So those are the technical issues. But the point I want to make to you is that underlying these technical issues are much more profound issues of policy and politics. Uh, the first question uh, centers on um, a very long-standing debate um, among the international community on the civil fuel cycle. 
And as you all know, reprocessing and enrichment, uh, even though it can be used for peaceful purposes, it also can be used for military purposes because it produces fissile material that are dual use. So these sensitive facilities, at least in US policy, have always been very controversial, both for nuclear proliferation and for nuclear security reasons. And the US, since the Carter administration, has generally opposed the spread of enrichment and reprocessing for civil purposes beyond those countries that already possess it. In fact, the US has never granted prior consent to any country that doesn't already have reprocessing and enrichment technology. So for example, in the one, two, three agreements the US has with Europe, with Japan, with most recently India, we've granted prior consent, but those countries already had uh, both enrichment and reprocessing. Uh, South Korea, if the US were to grant prior consent for South Korea, it would be the first time that the US has given prior consent to a country that doesn't already have it. And the US is concerned that that precedent would be used by other countries who would also seek prior consent um, to reprocess or enrich. Um, for example, Taiwan has a very extensive nuclear power industry and also faces problem with storage and disposition if it's spent nuclear fuel. So it might try to, South, it might try to follow South Korea's example. From the South Korean standpoint, they argue that uh, just because uh, they didn't have reprocessing and enrichment uh, 30 years ago, they shouldn't be denied the option of developing it now as a leading economic power, as a strong US ally, as one of the most important nuclear power countries in the world. Um, and from their standpoint, uh, they shouldn't be relegated to a permanent second class status. And obviously the fact that Japan has both enrichment and reprocessing raises particularly important nationalistic reasons in Seoul since the Koreans don't want to be treated um, you know, differently than Japan. So that's the second issue. But I think there's an even deeper issue which is often not fully spoken about among the governments. And that concerns the potential spread of nuclear weapons in East Asia. Uh, Washington is concerned that if uh, ROK develops enrichment and reprocessing for civil purposes, it will give North Korea an excuse uh, to retain its own enrichment and reprocessing for quote unquote peaceful purposes. Of course, it would really be a cover for their nuclear weapons program, but it would allow the North Koreans to claim equal treatment with South Korea and make denuclearization, which is already nearly impossible, much more difficult to achieve. Um, Moreover, the, I think the U.S. recognizes that in the long term, if North Korea continues to advance uh, its uh, nuclear weapons program and its long-range missile program, it will inevitably put increased pressure on South Korea and Japan uh, to consider leaving the NPT and building nuclear weapons, building their own nuclear deterrent. Now, I want to make clear that despite the, the um, the uh, public debate that's going on now in South Korea, I don't think the South Korean government is on the verge of going nuclear, either asking the US to return tactical nuclear weapons or building their own nuclear weapons. But I do think there is an unspoken belief among many South Korean officials that in the long term, uh, the development of a civil fuel cycle capability will create a shortcut, shortcut to a nuclear weapons option if in the future, South Korea feels that the US security guarantees are not sufficient, and South Korea needs to deploy its own nuclear forces. And obviously, if South Korea uh, develops nuclear weapons, it's, I think, it, almost impossible to imagine that Japan wouldn't follow suit, and the you know, security architecture of East Asia would be fundamentally changed, which is something the US would not see as desirable. So as I've described, um, the US ROK negotiations over the 1-2-3 agreement are much more profound than the narrow technical issues of managing spent nuclear fuel. They involve questions that deal with the global spread of civil, um, uh, 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 civil nuclear fuel technology and fundamentally the potential for nuclear proliferation in East Asia. Given these underlying deeper issues, I think it's very unlikely that Washington and Seoul are going to be able to reach agreement 
on, on a, a, a new one, two, three agreement in the time remaining. Uh, the current agreement expires uh, in March of next year. And in all likelihood, both the National Assembly and Congress will need to approve an agreement. And if you take politics into consideration, plus, as I've talked about, the fundamental issues, I think it's unlikely uh, that a new agreement can be, um, uh, um, uh, can be reached. Uh, at the same time, the expiration of the current agreement would be unacceptable. It would lead to fundamental disruption in nuclear trade between the U.S. and ROK in nuclear fuel and components, and it would disrupt the South Korean uh, nuclear power uh, project in the UAE. So therefore, my recommendation is that President Obama and President Park Geun-hye uh, should agree to a simple extension of the current agreement for a couple of years to allow more time for the negotiators to try to work out a compromise. Now, this extension would have to be approved by uh, both legislatures, but I think both countries could make the case that this is uh, much better than having the agreement break down and doesn't really sacrifice either country's position. Uh, instead, it just gives the negotiators more time to try to work out a tough issue. So my recommendation, when you're faced with a problem you can't solve, is kick the can down the road. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Sharon? Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. <clears throat> Gary, uh, I think you've said it all. But I'm going to try and um, uh, build on some of the points you made. Um, unfortunately, I think that these sensitive technologies like uranium enrichment and spent fuel reprocessing have, for South Korea, um, become an issue of status. And we haven't, you know, we really haven't been able to, to crack this nut um, in decades. So um, not only has South Korea made it into an alliance issue, but it's also, gee, Japan has this, why shouldn't we? And in a lot of ways, that just defies economics and logic in the case of South Korea. And let me go through a few of those points. Um, Gary, you mentioned that uh, South Korea believes it needs uranium enrichment um, for its, um, to increase its competitive advantage as a nuclear supplier. Well, it's got one major uh, nuclear contract with the UAE for four reactors, but it got that contract. It won that award without having domestic uranium enrichment. And as a matter of fact, the United Arab Emirates um, did a very smart thing, which was to diversify its sources of enriched uranium. So it sent out uh, contracts to Rosatom and Areva and some other suppliers because guess what? The nuclear industry is all about interdependence. And even though uh, some observers would like to make this debate into you know, well, gee, it's all about security on the peninsula and it's the U.S.-South Korean relationship and everything else. You know, this basic point about nuclear industry and global competition is there. It's about interdependence. So the ROK needs uh, U.S. vendors as much as U.S. vendors need them. So I don't think <laughs> there will be a lapse. I think there will be some frantic scrambling. Um, uh, when the deadline approaches, but I think in the end there will be a recognition that some of these big deals, um, you know, need to move forward. Um, back to the economics issue. So, there, so, so one is uh, nuclear supply. Um, there's another argument that South Korea has made, and that is that it can enrich uranium cheaper than other competitors. So this is reportedly, we've seen this in newspaper articles from South Korean officials. Uh, this is based on uh, a reported uh, study that Korean Nuclear Fuel did. Um, this is extremely speculative. Um, I really do not believe that um, South Korea could enrich uranium cheaper than Urenko can, and certainly not cheaper than the Russians can. So I think we can sort of put that uh, argument aside. And then finally on economics, um, the economics of the fast reactor fuel cycle. You know, this technology, pyroprocessing, 
is really geared at this point towards making fuel for fast reactors. Well, how many fast reactors in the world are actually providing electricity? Uh, you know, BN 600, maybe? Uh, they're not, and they haven't been for decades, and they probably won't for decades. So that economic uh, argument also um, doesn't hold any water. But the, the other point about pyroprocessing that South Korea uh, makes, which is that this is going to be the solution to its uh, spent nuclear uh, waste, sorry, its nuclear waste problem, um, that's also a really difficult, I mean, it's a, they're in a difficult position, as the U.S. is, in terms of its nuclear waste. But really, I think it's highly doubtful that um, this particular technology is going to solve their political problems. You know, we all need to find a solution to long-term disposal of nuclear waste. Um, but, you know, as other countries have found out, even if you had reprocessing, that doesn't solve your nuclear waste problem, right? You're always going to have to have a repository. Um, I wanted to put this in a little bit of the broader non-proliferation context. Um, and it's a funny, you know, when you look at the existing agreement, it's a very funny agreement. I've looked, when I worked for Congress, looked at every single nuclear cooperation agreement that the U.S. has signed. Um, this agreement dates back, the amendment dates back to 1974. This was the year before South Korea joined the NPT. So it would be very nice simply to amend the agreement, but <laughs> there's a funny thing about the law. The N Nuclear Nonproliferation Act in 1978 required the U.S. government to go back and renegotiate all of its existing agreements. And we did that with two exceptions, Taiwan and South Korea. And so, you know, it's possible that it could squeak by, uh, but there are important things in that 1978 law which just aren't in this agreement. There are requirements for physical protection. There are requirements for full scope safeguards, a, a whole host of things that I think might be a, a little bit of a stumbling block. However, I think, you know, members of Congress, if you said, look, we really need to do this, um, can you help us out here? Uh, I'm sure the best legal minds might be able to find a way. Um, there are two things from the nonproliferation world that I think a lot of people forget about, and that is um, the Symington and Glenn Amendments that date from 1976 and 1977, and these were supposed to um, provide restrictions or actually punishment uh, for countries that acquired enrichment and reprocessing capabilities. Now, do I think that these, the, the kinds of bans on, uh, and it's not just military assistance, it's economic, military training and education, uh, military credits and guarantees, do I think that they would be automatically cut off if South Korea got enrichment or reprocessing technology from another country? No. <coughs> there, there are ways of getting around it. But those two laws, um, you know, set sort of what the U.S. was trying to do in the 1970s when non-proliferation or proliferation was quite a serious thing. And I think there would be some, uh, a little bit of dancing, <laughs> maneuvering that would uh, have to be done if South Korea moved forward separately to acquire these capabilities from other countries. So I'm just going to... Um, close my remarks by offering a few solutions to the stalemate. So Gary mentioned one, extend the agreement, um, you know, for five to, to ten years, and you could do this perhaps with a rider on an existing piece of legislation, if you could get a piece of legislation through this Congress. Uh, that said, notwithstanding Section 123 of the Atomic Energy Act, that, that's a possibility. Um, you could simply sign a new agreement that met all the requirements of the current law uh, with a 10-year time frame and say, at the end of 10 years, we'll go back and um, we'll look at this issue of long-term consent when we know a lot more uh, from this 10-year joint study. Um, and then there are variations on that theme, which is you could do an agreement with a longer uh, period, 30 to 40 years, and say, okay, in 2024, we'll 
we'll reassess the consent rights, or you could do, the, the trend is to do an indefinite, you know, an agreement with indefinite uh, extensions and do that. Or you could write something in there that says uh, you could have a provision for long-term consent in the event that Korea builds a multinationally controlled uh, facility on Korean soil. Now, there are a lot of precedents for this, and even in the Symington and Glenn amendments, they talk about multinational or multi multilateral control uh, of, uh, when, the, when that's an option, when it's available. Uh, but you'd have to be very, very careful about what you actually meant by that. Um, and that's where <coughs> that option may face some difficulties because, um, you know, there's nothing worse than a bad law that <laughs> creates a lot of loopholes. So um, I welcome our discussion on uh, when we get to the Q&A session. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Chris. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be back here at CSIS. I've been in this room for a while, actually. But uh, um, I think, um, uh, first of all, I think the, the facts have sort of been made very clear uh, here. And so I think the real issue is what are, we, what are we going to do about this right now? And I can't think of a worse time to try to address this issue <coughs> than the current time frame. Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, I think the North Koreans have, uh, as always, come in at a time to make things more difficult, but not only the North Koreans. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a very difficult time to move ahead with this issue, and I agree with Gary that the likely outcome is going to be to somehow uh, kick this uh, down the road, depending on you know, what can come out of our Congress. But uh, I think there are people who understand that you cannot have an interruption in this, uh, in the one, two, three agreement. Um, this, this is for, even though there's only been this uh, UAE uh, agreement, one senses in Korea and from Koreans that nuclear energy is sort of what uh, automobiles were in the 80s. <laughs> Uh, that this is really uh, looked to Korea as a strategic export of, uh, of the kind that will uh, come to play a major uh, role in the Korean economy. If you look at the number of power plants being, uh, being built in Korea, I mean, they've got projections out to 2030, and we're, we're looking at uh, something on the order of 50, 60 percent of electricity being produced by nuclear, nuclear energy. Um, I don't think there's any turning back in, in Korea's plans to make uh, nuclear energy a main source of domestic uh, uh, um, electricity production and a main source of, of export earnings. And so the history of standing, uh, of trying to uh, prevent Koreans from uh, doing something like that in the past is, is not a very uh, successful history. And so I suspect that UAE is just the beginning of what will be, you know, efforts worldwide. So I, I think this is, because it is so important, I think it does engage sort of na uh, kind of Korean nationalism in a, in a sort of sense that the country has to go forward and, and do this. Uh, needless to say, however, in the context of polling data that indicates a rise in interest in Korea having its own uh, 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 weaponized uh, nuclear, nuclear industry, in the context of even some politicians talking that way, uh, this is hardly a good time to be, uh, to be talking about the uh, question. Um, we have to see what Japan's nuclear industry is going to look like in the future. That's uh, had a few kind of clutchless shifts in, uh, in uh, impetus. I mean, I think now it's kind of on a go basis, but we have to see what that looks like. So I think all in all, this really looks like something that has to be uh, uh, dealt with uh, at some point in the, in the future. I, I don't want to see the issue become a kind of litmus test of the uh, of the uh, relationship, the U.S. Uh, ROK relationship, and I fear that that's kind of where we're heading in the current uh, in in the current climate. I mean, it's sort of the uh, the FDA of uh, of 2013, and and I don't think that's good for the uh, for the alliance at this point. Um, 
at the same time, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think the alliance is, is strongest when we kind of get a good uh, sense of how the other partner in the alliance is feeling. And uh, right now, these are, these are important times in, in the ROK for a lot of reasons, but not the least of which is this strategic uh, uh, decision, basically, to go ahead with uh, making nuclear power or nuclear uh, uh, plants a major part of Korea's export uh, profile. So I think we have to be careful about that. And I, I'm, I, I agree with the argument that there's more, uh, there's probably more smoke than fire here, the idea that uh, um, Korea is at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis some of the, uh, you know, France or, or, or Russia is probably overstated, uh, certainly overstated within Korea. But I just think we need to be careful that this does not look somehow like we are keeping Korea down or keeping Korea in a second echelon uh, position. Because if the concern is somehow a proliferation concern, uh, I think that will actually cause those polling numbers to get worse <laughs> rather than better. So I think we need to be very, very careful uh, not to be uh, uh, not to be sort of adding to this uh, sort of impetus right now in, in, in South Korea. Um, Victor, I think we've kind of discussed all the, pretty much all the facts. I will mention uh, uh, one aspect of the whole North Korea, uh, the negotiations that uh, we took part in together, which was the issue of should we allow North Korea a light water reactor? And you recall the uh, uh, the North Koreans took this as sort of a God-given right that they should be able to develop civil nuclear power. And there they were actually quoting from the NPT on their, uh, their right to have, I mean, they had pulled out of the NPT, but we're still. Uh, and so um, we, I think, very carefully uh, came up with some turns of phrase in the September 05 agreement to uh, uh, which uh, kind of acknowledged North Korea as asserting this right. And then, uh, Victor, you recall us being very clear that we would not, uh, uh, that, we, that we could have a uh, discussion of this at an appropriate time, and the appropriate time would be when North Korea is back in the NPT with IEA safeguards, et cetera, et cetera, and had come into compliance. So um, I, I think, uh, we made it kind of clear on that, but I think probably part of what fuels this current issue is how India was handled. I, I mean, ironically, the North Koreans raised India, and I remember telling Kim Gae Gwan, you know, there's not enough uh, time in the world to explain to you the difference between <laughs> India and your lovely little country. And, uh, um, but I think with respect to South Korea, I think India is a factor in, in the thinking. And I think it would be a little hard to just kind of dismiss that. So uh, all in all, I think we're looking at, um, you know, uh, in, in Gary's turn of phrase, uh, kicking the can down the road. Great. Um, well, let me um, follow up with a couple of questions. And before we go to the audience, um, and the first are um, for uh, Gary and Sharon. Gary, when you say, and, and I don't, I mean, I actually agree. I mean, I don't, this is, it doesn't look like, unless they have, the two governments have deliberately set our expectations very, very low, uh, I, I don't see a solution to this in the next couple of weeks, and it's most likely some sort of extension. But I guess, in that sense, my question would be, um, when we say a simple extension, nothing is ever simple. And what are, so if you could elaborate on what a simple extension would be, I mean, certainly the Koreans <coughs> would push for some sort of language that would get at the things that they're looking for. Um, and so that was my question for you. For Sharon, um, the, the third of your proposed solution, this long-term consent, if there is uh, some sort of multinational control, of, I mean, so I guess one is how do the Koreans react to something like that in your, in your view, in your discussions. Um, and then uh, for Chris, I guess the, the hardest question, which is uh, if we do end up coming out of the back end of this upcoming summit with something that looks like language leaning in the direction of a simple extension, 
how does that look from a South Korean from the South Korean president's perspective? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that is that um, seen as a, a win, a, a neutral, or a real loss? And mm -hmm. how does that not become her her beef issue, mm -hmm. if you will? So, yeah. um, so. Yeah. Sure. I think, well, there are two different versions of what an extension would look like. One would be to update the existing agreement in those areas that are not particularly controversial, like enhanced provisions for nuclear security, which the two governments have already agreed to that language, frankly. I mean, my concern would be the more that you try to dress up the current agreement with new language, the more it will uh, become a political problem for President Park to explain that she hasn't given away the country's nuclear sovereignty. I mean, the great value of just taking the existing agreement, as inadequate as it is, and just giving it another five years before it expires, both, ki both sides can say this is simply a way to buy more time so the negotiators can work out a solution, and you know, uh, no changes have been made in, this, you know, in the existing agreement. I fear, like as in any negotiation, once you try to gild a lily, Mm -hmm. One side or the other will see that or try to hold it hostage to the other side, to other concessions. And I just think that is going to prolong this process beyond the time that we really have. I mean, if it wasn't for the fact that uh, the National Assembly and Congress had to approve, I think we could wait until March 31st. And then the two governments could just issue a statement saying they've extended the agreement for five years. But given the uncertainty of politics in both countries, and this is not just the immediate politics of nuclear cooperation, but as Sharon alluded to, the broader politics of stalemate in this country. And you know, I don't think in the U.S. Congress, I don't think an extension of U.S. ROK peaceful nuclear cooperation would be controversial. I think people would think that's a normal yeah. thing to do. But it could become part of a bigger problem. And so I'm nervous that if we wait too much longer we're going to find ourselves in a situation where we literally can't, according to the lawyers, we literally cannot extend the agreement because we won't have approval by the legislatures and the agreement will expire. Thanks. Uh, Sharon? Yeah, in response to your question, Victor, you know, it depends on who you talk to, obviously. <laughs> so the technical folks in uh, Korea will say, multinational, that's great. You mean U.S. Korean, right? Um, <coughs> To which I always respond, well, not exactly. Um, some of the officials in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are intrigued by this idea, mostly because it contributes to um, South Korea's non-proliferation standing, right? I mean, we have talked with the South Koreans for many years, how do you improve your non-proliferation credibility because Frankly, there have been some things in the past which have detracted from that credibility. Um, when you get right down to it, I mean, I suppose you could uh, say to South Korea um, on enrichment, why don't you invite Urenko to build a facility on your soil and just have it owned by Urenko? Um, but the business end of that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> Number one, we have enough enrichment capacity in the world. Uh, and number two, it's much cheaper for Urenko simply to add capacity at its own sites. Um, so I, I think you run into some real, you run into some practical problems with that. And then in, if you think about, you know, I've even talked to uh, both Koreans and Japanese about, well, how about we multinationalize the Japanese um, facilities like Rikasho because now <laughs> there's a lot of uncertainty about where the Japanese uh, industry is going. And there you run into uh, deep, longstanding um, political sensitivities. And so I've even heard some Korean officials say, why would we even think of that? Um, so even though it sounds like um, uh, a useful option, it, it would take quite a, a bit of work to get there if you could. Um, could I just respond just a little Go bit ahead, to please. something that Ambassador Hill said on <coughs> the nuclear energy part of it? Um, 
Yes, I do believe that South Korea thinks of itself as becoming a major nuclear exporter. It's mm -hmm. put out <coughs> figures of, yes, we're going to export 80 nuclear power reactors yeah. over the next 20 years. Um, when you talk to experts uh, in Korea, they'll even say, well, that's a little ridiculous, yeah. that number. It, it happens to be the, you know, represent 20% of the global market. But these were projections before Fukushima. Okay? Yeah. There is no doubt in my mind that nuclear energy is going to go forward in China. But as to the rest of the world, it, you, you really um, have to take what the nuclear industry itself says with a grain of salt. So there are going to be a lot fewer reactors being built over time. And even though Korea could do quite an adequate job of um, you know, getting some of those contracts, even competing against the Russians, these were not real money makers. As a matter of fact, the Korean government had to extend something like 50% in credit or there's a complicated formula for these reactors in UAE. So, I mean, a lot of people think that those reactors are going to be lost leaders and, you know, you're going to have to sell a lot of these things to actually realize profit. So, I think the picture there is murky, but I don't disagree with you how the South Korean government sees that, I think we have to be a little more honest with them about that. Okay. Sharon, I, I completely agree with that point uh, that you've made. Um, I also agree with, I think, a very important point you made, which is the South Koreans have not made the case for competitive disadvantage on this. So I, I, I'm completely with you. But I will tell you, if you look at the history of the Korean post-war economy, every single thing they have suggested They've been told, oh, don't do that. There's no profit in it. There's no future <laughs> in it. Don't do that. Every single thing, shipbuilding, you name it. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I, I realize that the idea of this prediction of 20% of the market, I mean, you talk to people in the nuclear field and no one believes that. But I think the Korean public believes it. And what would be worse is if it doesn't happen, we get blamed. <clears throat> for the fact that it doesn't happen. We become the kind of ready-made scapegoat. So all I'm saying is we've got to be kind of careful that this issue doesn't turn into, uh, I mean, Victor said the beef issue. I, I'm, I think it's a broader issue, actually, of the, uh, you know, one of these tests of the relationship. Because after all, if the issue is over concerns about reprocessing, and I take your point that there's plenty of reprocessing already, but if, if the issue kind of morphs into the question of uh, can we trust the, the Koreans? Well, you know, if you're Koreans, if, if you can't trust us, who are you going to trust? I mean, uh, out there in the world. Um, India, is, is that your, your friend here? Uh, because they've already developed nuclear weapons. Uh, so I'm just saying, I, I'm not predicting a, predicting a train wreck, uh, but I think it's got to be very carefully managed. And I think Gary's, uh, point that in trying to sort of uh, fix it up and modernize it, gilding the lily, we would end up with a situation where uh, people would start looking carefully and go, well, if you did that, why didn't you do this? So I I'm of the view that probably a st straight up extension, because I'm of the view that it can't be done right now. I mean, I'm there. Uh, but I think a straight up extension with some language to the effect that we would uh, uh, put together some working group to address uh, outstanding issues, uh, you know, and, and really put that in the context of a very positive, special relationship uh, to get us through these very uh, kind of heady times. And I, I sort of, I, I mean, I, I, Sharon, I completely agree with you on the demand for nuclear power outside of China. But I'd sort of like to know where Japan is going, and, uh, and, and I think that's a fair question to be able to address when we look at what this looks like. Because, I mean, if the Koreans are left with the impression that Japan can do things that Korean can't do, it's just not a sustainable concept in the, uh, in the uh, bilateral U.S.-Korean relationship. So I just think it's a terrible time to be trying to do this, and it really argues for, for uh, dealing with it later, but maybe addressing it in the context of, you know, this is one of those things where the U.S. and ROK are going to work closely together on. 
Great. Um, so with that, we uh, now we'll go to the floor for questions. Uh, if you could just raise your hand, come up to the microphones, and introduce yourself, uh, Henry. Henry Sikulski with the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. Uh, first of all, thank you for holding this short notice, but still worth coming to. Uh, Ambassador Hill has made a pretty important point, I think, which is the sustainability of saying yes to Japan and no to South Korea. I mean, maybe you can kick the can for a few years on that, but at some point that is going to literally and figuratively blow up in your face. Has any thought been given to what we should be saying to the Japanese with regard to Rikasho, A, and B, when I explained to some folks at State what eight tons of plutonium per year was equivalent to, uh, their eyes widened, their jaws slackened, and a little, little light went off, which was it's roughly as many bombs worth of material as we have fully deployed in our entire weapons force. Do that every year. Now, the idea that you can do that without perhaps raising an eyebrow in China is an interesting thought, but you can see where I'm going. Uh, can you talk a little bit more than two years and what you'd have to do to avoid, I guess, the arrogance of Eisenhower, who is reported to have said that when you have a particularly intractable problem, you enlarge it. He was the author of Adams for Peace. It was a mess. Let's not go in that direction. How do we make it smaller? Thoughts, particularly starting off with Rikasha, which is supposed to open up in October. Well, let me, you know, take a crack at it. I mean, I think that um, at least um, for the Obama administration, uh, post, um, you know, Fukushima and the sort of yo-yo up and down in Japanese policy toward the future of nuclear power, including the future, uh, you know, of the Rokosho facility, there was not really any need to focus on that in discussions with the Japanese government because there looked to be at least a reasonable prospect that Japan would decide on its own for financial and technical reasons that it really didn't make much sense to proceed with the facility. Uh, and so our focus was very much on nuclear security, which I want to say in the last four years has really tremendously improved U.S.-Japanese discussion on safeguarding nuclear materials. Because, of course, the truth is whether or not Rokosho operates, Japan already has very large stockpiles of fissile material, which in theory could be used for nuclear weapons and in theory could pose a potential target for nuclear terrorists. Um, now it looks like the gov you know, Japanese government's leaning in the direction of starting Rokosho up, as they claim. Whether they really will or not, we've heard this before, whether they really will or not, I think, is unclear. My personal view is that a direct sort of address from the U.S. government to Japan on this issue is not going to be productive. I do not think the U.S. is in a position to go to Tokyo at this point and say, we think this is unwise for you to develop you know, reprocessing. Saying the opposite, well, e even if we took a, I mean, if you took a neutral position, it clearly is not going to change Tokyo's view. Um, if we took a, a negative position, I just don't think it would be effective. I, I mean, I think if anything, it would it Many would arouse seminars. Japanese nationalist views. Yeah. Yeah. Many more seminars now. <laughs> <laughs> I think Rikasho points to the difficulties you have when you go down this path, right? The Japanese have put $20 billion into a facility that, uh, how many years is it? It's like a decade over schedule more or more. Um, and the difficulty they face, it's not just a technical decision for them, gee, are we going to open up our nuclear power plants and therefore we want MOX fuel? It is so deeply ingrained in political bargains that they made with Aomoki Prefecture, right? So that to take all these things apart is a painstaking process. And so, I mean, to my mind that argues, you know, <laughs> we should avoid this at all costs. Uh, for other countries unless it's absolutely necessary. And I think in the case of Japan, uh, which developed its reprocessing capabilities, again, with the fast reactor, 
fuel cycle, right? This was in, in the 1970s when we all thought there was going to be a uranium shortage, and we now know, well, guess what? No, there isn't, at least not for the next 100 years. Um, you know, it, it, it points to the, that this, these decisions should, should <laughs> require a lot more foresight. I mean, in terms of the technical um, points, the U.S.-Japanese Nuclear Cooperation Agreement has a 30-year expiration, um, but it then rolls over indefinitely so that, at least from the U.S. position, I believe this is correct, we don't have to renegotiate that agreement. By the way, that, so it that's, may, that's something still being debated among some. Well, yeah. right. I mean, right. you know, it, it's going to be a mutual agreement between U.S. and Japanese officials, and I think there, there's a variety of views on both sides. But just from a technical perspective, we may not have to, you know, reach that decision with Japan. Now, would this stop Korea from continuing <laughs> to make this comparison? Absolutely not. Um, but I think, Henry, you point, you know, the, the idea that Rokasha would start back up and produce all of this plutonium without any, um, or with a huge gap between use. I mean, who knows how many of those Japanese reactors will ever come online again. Um, and you can't just make MOX fuel and let it sit because, y you know, it becomes unusable after a while. So um, it's a big mess, <laughs> I guess I would conclude. I don't have any okay. more to add. I agree it's a big mess, though. <laughs> uh, do you? Hi, Dean Ken, Center for Arms Control and Proliferation. Thank you all uh, for your excellent insights. My question is for Gary, uh, actually, f just for obvious reasons, you were just in government, your insights. Uh, it's already been reported widely in the press that even before an announcement this week uh, that the two governments have decided on a short-term extension at current levels, whether it's two years or three years or whatnot, and that announcement is pending for this week and if we imagine that nothing else changes and if these reports are true uh, you did mention that a simple extension might pass fairly well easily through Congress I was just curious if you could perhaps elaborate more on th such prospects because it does not the current agreement does not meet the 1978 NNPA standards so it does have to get approval from Congress and if it does past Congress. Uh, I'm curious, in your view, uh, what in the two or three years of that extension, uh, what could possibly change or improve or, or become different that could wide, uh, narrow the gap between the two allies on the enrichment and power processing, because that is the biggest sticking point at this time. Thank you. Well, I haven't heard these reports that the governments have already agreed to, uh, <laughs> to my recommendation to a short-term extension. And in fact, I think there may be a tendency to uh, try to use the deadline as a forcing event to hope that the other side blinks. I think that's a very dangerous game, as I've explained why, because I don't see at this point any likelihood that either side will blink. Um, but I do think that from, I mean, if the two governments agreed to a simple extension of the existing agreement, I think that it would probably be much less controversial in Congress than it would be in the National Assembly. I mean, I defer to others who are more expert, but I think it'd be a very easy sell in Congress to say that you know, South Korea is you know, one of our strongest allies, we have very extensive peaceful nuclear cooperation, we've simply run out of time to deal with these difficult issues, and we're asking for a short extension so that the experts can try to work on a compromise. I don't think that's a hard sell at all. I think it might be more difficult for President Park because there would be, well, we know the National <laughs> Assembly you know, could become another beef or a free trade agreement, could become a big nationalist issue. So I think the question would be to ask the South Korean government whether they, th whether they think they could manage a simple extension. Um, you know, what the ultimate solution looks like, I really don't know. I mean, I do think that, you know, there's a lot of strength to the South Korean argument that, you know, they, you know, have come a long way in 30 years, and should they be held hostage to a policy that we invented during the Carter administration, the world has changed. But I also think that there are some pretty significant as we've talked about, some pretty significant policy issues. And, I, you know, so I don't think, you know, there's a, sort of an obvious solution uh, to deal with it yet. 
Um, but I want to say I agree with what Sharon said, that there's, there is, from a technical standpoint, there is actually no immediate requirement for South Korea to develop pyroprocessing for spent fuel storage. There are other ways of storing spent fuel for decades, even centuries, you know, in above, gr in, in above ground concrete bunkers. So, and there's certainly no need for the plutonium for a box or fat, fast fuel cycle. So I think from that standpoint, I don't think it's true that we sort of face an urgent need for a decision. I, I understand why South Korea is impatient. Um, and as I said, I think there are underlying motivations which are unspoken, but the longer it looks like North Korea is not going to be denuclearized, the more I think there's pressure on the South Korean government to at least pursue a path that creates an option, which Japan already has and, and has had for, for many years. Great. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Yes, Miles. Uh, Miles Pomper from the Monterey Institute. Uh, just wanted to correct a little bit one point you made, Gary, which was you said uh, all the other competitors have full suites of fuel cycle uh, capabilities. That's true of the French and the Russians. It's not true of Westinghouse, for instance. No, I said except the except U.S. The US. Yeah, exactly. right. All right, and and well, and, and Toshiba. So that's half. So two companies have full suite: the French well, and the Russians. I mean, Let's you Japan know. Japan has enrichment and reprocessing. But they're not doing it for export purposes. Okay. Which is the reason the, the Koreans <laughs> Thank are. Thank you for correcting. Let's <laughs> <laughs> wait for the Indians. Yeah. Um, the other, you know, more broadly, I think if you look at you know, this question about. Um, what the industry is saying and what the government is saying. If you talk to people in the industry, they don't expect to export 80 reactors. I mean, this is the Korean industry. This isn't the rest of the world's industry. They say maybe 10 nuclear plants by, that's the optimistic thing, by 2030. They say there's no need for enrichment capabilities, that they're better off just doing that in the private market or buying into a Urenco plant. So this is a Korean government national status prestige thing. This has absolutely nothing to do with business or economics. So I just wanted to make that point. There's a question. <laughs> have a comment, uh, Isn't that right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let, let, I mean, that let me just make it easier to <laughs> solve the problem. <laughs> well, that, yeah, you know, that does not. Go ahead, Sharon. Let me Sorry. make one point. We, we did, we hosted, uh, CSIS and the Asan Institute um, hosted a workshop two months ago in Seoul, uh, specifically on Korea as a responsible nuclear exporter. And what came to light was that, you know, Korea is building, I don't know how many, six or eight uh, nuclear reactors in Korea. And then it's got the four in the UAE. And they have a huge human resource problem. And so they're actually, they don't have enough experts to go around for all these projects. So they're working, they're planning on shifting their managers. <laughs> it's kind of this big, you know, operations research chart, shifting their managers from project to project every couple of years. Now. Obviously, if they want to, you know, if they're thinking about exporting that many uh, reactors, they're going to have to spend a lot of money to build up that infrastructure. And again, my point about investment, right? Once they do that, it's going to be very hard for them to walk back, right? Um, and, you know, what, what I've seen actually with the Japanese nuclear industry is, you know, even the, the premier uh, forging um, Japan Steelworks, we were talking to them seven, eight years ago and saying, well, the nuclear renaissance, aren't you going to, you know, increase your capacity? And they're like, well, maybe by two, you know, ultra heavy forgings a year. They were quite conservative uh, because that market is very, um, it's very difficult to project growth. Um, but I, I, I agree, Miles. I think there's, you know, there's a real, there, there's a gap there between sort of business reality and, and what we're seeing in the media from the government. Okay, well, um, so we shall see in the coming days, and uh, just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true, <laughs> uh, uh, whether, uh, how the two countries will deal with it. In the meantime, I want to thank uh, these experts for taking the time for joining us on talking about a very difficult and complicated topic. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria.